ahead and get started. Um, welcome to New America and our event today, uh, The Color of Money, Race, Wealth, and Communities on the Front Lines of Economic Justice. Uh, my name is Rachel Black. I co-direct our Family-Centered Social Policy Program here at New America, where we are working to investigate the role of identity in shaping social policy and develop the tools to make it more representative of and responsive to the families it serves. Uh, as Marissa Brandaran uh, details in her new book, the topic of today's conversation, uh, identity has played a definitional role in determining who has wealth in this country and who doesn't. Uh, the color of money has been and continues to be white. Uh, as a consequence, black Americans own about the same amount of our nation's wealth as they did uh, after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, importantly, the story we tell about why this, uh, this gap continues uh, more than 150 years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, is really critical to shaping the kind of solutions uh, that we craft. Uh, unfortunately, these narratives that we use to understand the differences in, uh, in wealth by race are actually the ones that we use to justify uh, the government actions that created these differences to begin with. Uh, one of the narrative through lines uh, going from then to now is the idea of black criminality. Uh, as described by Ibram Kendi and stamped from the beginning, the definitive history of racist ideas in America, from their arrival around 1619, African people had illegally resisted legal slavery. They had thus been stamped from the beginning as criminal. And this brand helped support the institution of slavery then as a practice serving public safety. Um, and then the enactment of black codes, you know, that, um, that states adopted throughout the post-Civil post War South, which criminalized everything from being an idle and dissipated person to misspending what they earn. Uh, in this way, the narrative of criminality is deeply enmeshed with the narratives of laziness and irresponsibility uh, or shorthand a lack of thrift um, that continues to frame our understanding of racial differences and wealth as a product of moral failings instead of systemic exclusion. Uh, today, the legacy of um, black criminality as a tool of economic exclusion is clear in our current criminal justice system, uh, which has defined what acts are criminal and against whom the law is enforced in ways that disproportionately impact people of color and the practice of municipal fees and fines that profits from the system. Uh, this practice was brought to national attention uh, by a Department of Justice investigation after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, neighboring to Shari Jones's home of St. Louis, Missouri, and efforts to reform this practice are being led by Ann Stuhl Dreher's work with the Financial Justice Program uh, in project in San Francisco. We're thrilled that both of you can be here to talk about your work. Uh, in her book, Marissa also introduces us to the narrative of black capitalism as a modern rationalization for the persistence of wealth and equality. This narrative tells us that it's the invisible hand of capitalism that has uh, placed a lower value on black homes, credit, and labor, rather than the deliberate and intentional choices policymakers have made to preserve the material benefit of being white. As a result, this, a suite of government programs have sought to address the lack of black wealth by building the economic self-reliance of black communities. Unfortunately, uh, these efforts have amounted to little more than a band-aid to fix a fundamentally broken system. Uh, as she explains, black capitalism delegated the responsibility to solve the racial wealth gap to the black community without the help of the white political establishment who had always held power and the purse strings and who continued to do so. So I think nestled in this problem statement is where we go to look for solutions. Beyond challenging these false narratives, we have to change the government structures that translate these narratives into public policy. So the people you'll hear from this afternoon are leading this work to create more equitable policy for their communities they serve, and I hope this conversation will broaden our imagination of what's possible. So to start, maybe? Uh, Jillian White, who will be um, orchestrating our conversation today from the Atlantic, 
uh, we'll be talking to Mary Sparatoran about her book, establishing some of this history and the way that uh, issues of lack of black wealth play out at the community level. And then we're gonna bring in uh, a suite of economic justice warriors, starting with Richard Berry, uh, with the Office of Community Wealth Building in Richmond, Virginia, uh, Ann Stuldreyer, who's the Director of Financial Justice with the City and County of San Francisco, and Tashara Jones, who is the Treasurer uh, for the City of St. Louis. Uh, you can all follow us along, people in our online viewing audience, using hashtag color money and at New America FCSP. So with that, turn it over to you, Jillian, thanks. Thank you, thanks so much to you, Rachel, and thank you to New America for having us all here. Let me know if you guys can not hear me at any point in time, okay? So I have to say I'm feeling especially lucky to be leading this conversation, not just because I'm super interested in this topic, but because there was a point last year where Mirsa and I found ourselves in the back of a million different events having this conversation, um, and I knew she was working on this book, and every time I would see her, I would tell her how excited I was for it, um, and it did not disappoint. Um, so I do encourage you guys all to pick up the book. Obviously, this is something you're interested in. You're all here. So I want to start out by asking, you wrote about postal banking before. This is something you've been working on for quite some time. Why black wealth and black banking, of all the things you could write about? Good question. So I actually, um, I was, this is like eight years ago, I was sitting in my office and I was doing this history, I, I write about the history of credit unions and thrifts and all of these other interesting banks and I started, I stumbled upon this history of black banks and so I told a librarian, hey will you go get me the book about black banks and he's like, no one's ever written about black banks. I'm like what? I mean this is this phenomenal history and no one had ever written about it and so at that time I was like, I, I gotta write this book and so that was, you know, uh, eight years ago and um, I thought I would just write, um, and then I had to write another book first because that, that one uh, was you know, more pressing, but um, as I started writing about this book, I thought I would just write a history of black banks, right? You know, start with the Friedman Bank and then on down, just look at these interesting banks. But what it ended up becoming, as, as, as you know, was this um, uh, history of injustice and of politics. And um, I was just really surprised by the story that I found in these black banks. Is that not just this story of like you know these Horatio Algers and these great black banks? Look at these you know heroes and these you know uh, communities that, despite Jim Crow and segregation, they were able to build these black banks. What I saw as I studied their balance sheets and as I studied the politics is, oh my gosh, it's it's impossible to um, uh, to overcome this wealth gap with the black banks. And I, so I, I ended up using them as a way to shine a spotlight onto the injustices that created the wealth gap and how it self-perpetuates with black banks included. Right. So I want to set a little bit of context when we're talking about black wealth. Um, kind of roughly estimated, a number that's cited often is that median black wealth is 13 times lower than median white wealth. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're talking about when we talk about wealth in general and then how those things are racialized. So what types of assets, what are we talking about when we talk about wealth, and what on earth does it have to do with the color of your skin versus just the amount of money you have in the bank or, you know, as you said, balance sheets? Yeah. So um, in this century, in the 20th century, uh, wealth, intergenerational wealth for the majority of the population was created through home ownership. And it was through the FHA, you know, post-New Deal era, you know, GI Bill, uh, VA Bill, FHA Bill that created intergenerational wealth. All of that wealth excluded the black population. That's this century. In the previous century, it was land, right? So you cannot gain wealth without land, a home, all of which is provided by government subsidized credit or has been in our um, century. So, so that's what I talk about when I talk about wealth is how uh, it's not about you know, uh, a savings account. The savings account is a product of that intergenerational wealth. It is not the cause of it, right? So that's one of the myths, I think, was, oh, wealth is you save your money and that creates wealth. No, you have a home and then you're able to save your money and that creates wealth. And so that, I think, is some, a, a myth I'm trying to dispel. So until you have you know, that home that can, by the way, build, grow, right? Uh, and historically, black homes have not been able to appreciate then you cannot build wealth that you pass down to your children. Yeah, so I want to stay on the home thing for a second because as somebody who says this, obviously, as everyone works in this, I think before I started researching this a lot, I had no idea how much 
A, home ownership played into wealth accumulation, and B, the vast discrepancies in home value appreciation between black and white Americans. I think when you talk to people about housing segregation, they think about it as something that happened in the past and something that has since ended. So it's unclear what the link is between housing segregation that a lot of people think ended in the civil rights era with the passage of lots of acts, including fair housing, and what we see today up to and including and through the subprime mortgage crisis. So can you give us a little update on why <laughs> we are talking about home ownership and home appreciation and kind of what the legacy of discrimination is there? Okay. The, I mean, the, the, the ugly truth of it is that we still have a population that doesn't want to have black neighbors. Um, the second a black a, a community is over 10% black homes, the property values decline. Um, we still have a segregated society, and l largely that's because of home ownership. The last um, policymaker to try to integrate was Nixon's HUD secretary, George Romney, who got pushed out after two integration efforts. And he was a zealot. He was, you know, we have this, he says, a noose around the black ghetto, right? So he was very much a, you know, a, a r racial warrior, and Nixon pushes him out. And as soon as George Romney leaves HUD, we have not had a single sort of integration effort. And so, okay, why is integration necessary? We don't need to integrate. We just need black communities to have capital. And um, capital in home, loan, uh, in home ownership or some other way that they can grow that wealth. And so it doesn't have to be through integration, but historically that's been the only route that um, communities have been able to increase their uh, home ownership. And so, uh, you know, we, we still live essentially in that in the shadow of Jim Crow. We just don't call it that anymore. Right, and while we're talking about capital, this dovetails nicely into kind of the overarching theme of the book, which was mm -hmm. black banks. And I think the idea that really stuck out to me, and the reason that I really love talking about black banks, is because this is an idea that still exists today. As recently as last year, I was writing about the black bank, the bank black movement, and this idea that. Economic self-sufficiency is the thing that will ultimately help the black community overcome these gaps. If they won't give it to us, we will take it, we will create it in, in our own communities and by ourselves. So talk to me a little bit about the legacy of black banking and where it stands today. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the first you know, black leader who, to suggest black banking was Frederick Douglass. And it makes sense. After you've got you know, heavy Jim Crow, post-Civil War, he says we need to save our money have our own institutions because by nature of Jim Crow, they weren't allowed to get credit from and or deposit in white-owned banks. So we have this system of segregated banking that develops in tandem with Jim Crow. And that makes sense in a way because, you know, the white community is saying no. Post-Jim Crow, um, black banking became this way of white policymakers saying, we're, uh, this is, you know, starts with Nixon, but starts saying, we're not going to integrate. And we're not going to provide reparations. Those were the two options on the table. Why don't you all have your own system of banks and your own system of credit? And so that's where this you know, shift in the, uh, the way we talk about black capitalism starts to turn a little bit, um, I call it, into a policy decoy. At first it was sort of, this is necessary. We have to have black banks because we're not allowed to be in white banks. But then it becomes um, n no to everything else. Um, go have your own banks. And, and, and this idea of self-sufficiency is, you know, uh, putting the burden of the racial wealth gap on the black community to sort of self-finance their way out of it, right? I talk about this, this myth that a beleaguered community that is segregated from the main sh sort of avenues of commerce, they can just sort of self-finance. You, you lend yourselves money. You guys pool your own resources, and you can lend to yourselves. That's never worked. That's never how community banking ever worked, right? We had this myth of like the George Bailey Bank and, you know, people putting their money in and you can fund your neighbor's um, um, home and that's how uh, communities build wealth. George Bailey's bank was always a myth, right? It was always through FHA credit that these banks, these thrifts were able to um, allow for home ownership and that was never available to the black community. So we kind of have this, you know, um, uh, this myth that you can segregate a community, they can all be poor, and then they'll just like self-finance their way out of poverty. It just doesn't work. So the chapter that you're talking about where you talk about Nixon and black capitalism, chapter six, I believe it is. Yeah. I think that's right. Was one of my favorite chapters. Um, and as I said, I think this is something that we come back to again and again. Anyone who has heard uh, Jay-Z's re recent album, he spends an entire ta song talking about 
the benefits of capitalism and how you can kind of harness the power of wealth to take care of your own, essentially. And you know, he's talking about how he went from being really, really poor to now you know, being basically almost a billionaire, not quite a billionaire, some, somewhere around there. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about what happened between kind of the genesis of this idea that if they won't help us, we will help ourselves, and when Nixon kind of co-opted that idea and said, actually, what we're going to do is call it black capitalism and make it look like we're helping, but actually what we're doing is taking away all of the actual things that could help you guys, mm -hmm. and we're going to leave you over here to flounder on your own. Yeah. So, I mean, I, we, I think we're far enough away from the civil rights era where it's time to really look at that history again and figure out exactly what happened, because I think we've also been um, talking about this wrong. I mean, we had this sense that like 1965 and 1964, we passed the civil rights era and you know, like fata cumpli, we're done. Um, that was never the case. Every principal sort of civil rights leader understood that that was just the beginning. So, you know, between 1968 and 1970, the world completely shifts. And by 1970, it's over. In 1968, there's a lot of possibilities. So what's happening in 1968, right? All the principals are gone. Malcolm X has been killed. Martin Luther King has been killed. Um, Robert Kennedy, uh, you know, Johnson's out of office. And um, jo John F. Kennedy has also been killed, you know. And so you have this um, new um, uh, movement coming out of the civil rights movement, which is this black power movement, right? We understand that, you know, integration is not going to happen. The white, there's already a white backlash happening during this time. And then there's a lot of rioting, right, in these um, black ghettos where there's this, this pent up economic frustration. And I talk about this in the book, it's because all of these um, communities, because they've been segregated from the mainstream uh, credit, so, so uh, suburbs have credit cards. You're able to buy now with credit cards. In the ghetto, you still have installment credit. So if you want a refrigerator, you want to you know, go to the hospital, you're paying by installment credit, which is really, really expensive. So these rioters, they're not like random, like we're just going to loot. They go and they're targeting these lenders and they're saying, burn the books, right? It's not just random property violations. They're, they're, they're feeling this exploitation. So you have this conversation happening that's saying, look, there's this problem. The poor are paying more, especially the black poor in these segregated black communities. What can we do about it? And so there's these, you know, so the, a, a conversation about, well, maybe we can do more black businesses. And, uh, and then the black community comes back and says, you know, we want ownership of the, of the ghetto, right? If we're going to be segregated and you're not going to do anything about that, let us at least own these areas. And so there's just black power, black enterprise, you know, black um, control of the ghetto. So Nixon comes into power. And he's very clear that he's using the Southern strategy. He's not about to give reparations or control of the ghetto to blacks. And so he shifts the conversation, um, pushes integration aside, um, rejects reparations, and comes up with this idea of black capitalism. And I've gone through his archives, and there's all these speeches that you see. And he's like, there's one speech that was uh, phenomenal to find. So I, I looked at the, the original speech, said, forget civil rights, right? we're now onto black capitalism. Then he crosses out forget and it says go beyond civil rights, right? So, so but, but essentially it was the same idea, right? Forget civil rights. We're now onto this other thing. And so what black capitalism is, is we're going to give deposits to black owned banks in the ghetto and we're going to, you know, have these voluntary donations by these big corporations like GE why don't you guys do an internship program in the ghetto? This is when affirmative action comes in, right? So it kind of takes the sting out of the black power movement, but really neutralizes these calls for actual power and turns it into uh, capitalism. And then after that, this is not just Nixon, right? Reagan follows along, Clinton, Obama, Trump's New Deal with America. Um, no one's ever, new, new Deal with Black America, no one really talks about it because there's so many other things to talk about. But Trump's New Deal for Black America is loans to black businesses. It's the same script that we've been following since Nixon started, and it really shifts the focus away from real structural reforms and says, okay, we're gonna keep the, get, you know, keep the black and white segregated, and we're gonna give you some deposits for your banks. So if the bank black movement in 2017 was going to succeed, if there was going to be some level of economic self-sufficiency, or even if you know, black Americans were just trying to keep their black banks alive, what would be needed from the government to make that happen? Capital. Um, I mean, deposits don't work. I mean, this is what I talk about. Deposits are bank liabilities. Um, deposits aren't 
money for the bank. It, it's, it's costly for banks to get these government deposits usually. So we need to understand how banks work in order to understand how to help these communities. And a lot of these programs just misunderstand what banks do. Banks can create money so long as they're part of a network that multiplies the money. If you have a bank in a segregated community, that bank needs capital, right? That community needs capital. Banks can't create capital. They can circulate it, right? So we need capital into these communities, not just deposits. Um, capital allows them to lend. We need capital and we need credit. And so far, we haven't had a structure that has allowed these banks to do that. So I want to open the conversation up to the wider panel uh, now, if I can. Risha, I want to start with you. You are, I want to get this right, you're in the Office of Community Wealth Building in Richmond, which is a name of an office that I have never heard of. So can you <laughs> talk to me a little bit more about what you guys are doing? I mean, it's an innovation in and of itself, right? It's the only one of its kind that exists. Absolutely. Uh, the Office of Community Wealth Building was really established in government. It's the first office of its kind. It was created in 2003. Um, at that particular time, there was um, Mayor Dwight Jones was really um, focused on tasking a task force with looking at ways to really solve poverty within the city. And not really from a standpoint where we just sort of study and study again and make recommendations, but to have some fundamental change in the way that we do things within city government. And so um, at that particular time, there was a big push around really institutionalizing the office so that there's a systematic way to become a hub and catalyst for action related to um, poverty reduction in the city. And so that's how we, we've gotten our start. Um, there are uh, high levels of, of expectation as a result of the creation of the office. Um, it was really started by a professor, um, Thad Williamson, with, um, he's from Harvard, and he works at University of Richmond, but his idea was really thinking about an out-of-the-box strategy of if we were really able to focus on this and get this right, what would it take? And one of the things that he did with the mayor was really to identify what is that number? What is that sweet spot? What's that number where we could really move the needle? Our office is charged with reducing poverty by 40% by 2030. At the time, he said, well, the mathematical number is 1,500 people. And really, given attrition, moving 1,000 people a year. And so people were really galvanized you know, around that. Like, wow, it's just 1,000 people. Get 1,000 people a job, and we'll solve poverty. Done and done. <laughs> yeah. But what we found, it's, it's intricate, right? It's, it's structural. And what we're really dealing with in poverty is an outgrowth of some structural conditions that have been created that have already been identified. One of the major um, factors is really redlining, you know, where there were areas that were identified and coded as A to D rated communities. And so in the city of Richmond, we have concentrated poverty, a large percentage of concentrated poverty. We have um, probably in our big six concentrated public housing is just, um, we are the leader in that across the country. And that's not something that we sort of wave the banner of, but it is something to really be reflective about. So what's germane to us in this conversation was Maggie Walker is from Richmond. And so being a first woman owned banker and a black woman banker is really central to sort of um, our core and how do you sort of uh, have this momentum to happen within the community around entrepreneurism and really going into the community for solutions rather than sort of looking at it from a, a census tract proximity, but going into the communities because that's where the problems can be solved. Sarah, I want to talk to you a little bit. Um, we talked about this before, but St. Louis, the areas around St. Louis have kind of become a central focal point for kind of all of the various dip inequalities that happen um, between blacks and whites, especially over the past few years. I'm wondering how you are tackling the economic and financial aspect of that amid so much else that's going on and I guess so much focus in that area. Right, so uh, the treasurer's office in the city of St. Louis is probably the most unique elected official you'll ever meet in the country because not only am I responsible for typical treasury functions, payroll, investments, cash management, I'm also the parking supervisor for the city of St. Louis. So 
um, all parking revenue also comes into my office. And so I have chosen to use that power for good and not evil. Mm -hmm. And when I got elected to this position in 2012, I looked at our community and found that a third of African Americans in the region were unbanked or underbanked. And I thought that that was an epidemic that needed to be addressed, uh, not only from people who were and nonprofits and other organizations were working on it, but there was no grass top leader who was saying, I'm going to address this and I'm going to, to help use my influence with the banking community to help uh, reduce the, the number of unbanked and underbanked population in, in the city or in the region. So I uh, ran on that as a policy platform and won and started the Office of Financial Empowerment in City Hall after I talked to Jose Cisneros um, about how he started his work in financial empowerment and I uh, started to address this in 2012 before the murder of Mike Brown. Now, the murder of Mike Brown actually brought a lot of the issues that were already blowing under the surface to the forefront, like our municipal court system and like our fines and fees and how they're very predatory. Um, and, and that was a good thing because, you know, black people have been living with that for years. You know, we would drive to North County and say, oh, wait, wait a minute, you're in North County. You got to slow down. You don't want to get stopped, you know, for any reason other than driving while black. So uh, fast forward to, you know, to now where we now have the Ferguson Commission report and has a whole host of, you know, 189 recommendations uh, so, and some of which are tied to financial empowerment and economic mobility. And, and myself and the treasurer's office, I've been able to uh, implement most of those, uh, most of the things uh, in the Ferguson Commission report around economic mobility. We have a universal children's savings program for every kindergartner in the city of St. Louis. We're in our third year, and hopefully this year we will be able to get um, almost 10,000 children in the program. They get $50 just by enrolling in kindergarten, and that comes directly from parking funds. So if you know people in St. Louis, tell them to park illegally and get a parking ticket. We also open, again, an Office of Financial Empowerment where our mission is to help people save and make better choices with their money. Uh, we use our children's savings program as an entry point to families to help them uh, learn the basic lessons of budgeting and saving and credit. Uh, we've also uh, just published a alternative to pay li payday lending guide because in Missouri, payday lending runs rampant. Um, we have more payday, lender, payday lenders than Walmarts, Starbucks, and McDonald's combined in the state of Missouri. So we just published a guide not only to let people know that there are alternatives that are available either locally or online, but we're also looking at the root causes of why people use payday lending. So we also put re, uh, resources related to rent and utility assistance uh, if they need to clean up their credit. We put uh, resources related to that as well. It's a you know front and back page document. So and and now we just passed um, a, a law in St. Louis that now every payday lender not only has to pay five thousand dollars every year to exist for their business business license but they also have to give out this paid alternative to payday lending guide every time someone comes in their door to take out a payday loan. So we, we, that's, a, that's a thought process that they have to go through. And then also, um, we, we've been able to also address uh, uh, the transportation issue. Transportation is a huge issue in the city of St. Louis, as in, as in most urban communities. So we funded uh, the update of our um, uh, public transit study so we can expand public transit um, in the city of St. Louis because what's desperately needed is a line that goes from uh, North St. Louis, which is uh, concentrated where most, most African Americans live, to South St. Louis, which is where, you know, where all of the jobs are. So we have to use public transportation in order to connect people to jobs in a shorter amount of time than it currently takes on the bus because a two hour commute on the bus could take 30 minutes by car. So we see ourselves in the treasurer's office not only just you know as a typical you know treasurer, but we see it we see ourselves as as an office that helps also with economic mobility of the citizens. So we take our mission and and we expand it to make sure that we are addressing uh, people's needs in more ways than one. And your work focuses on financial justice, economic justice. I want you to talk a little bit about that, but I also want you to to define that term for me. How do you define it? Ooh. Um, <laughs> when 
when we think about, and in, in my office, the Financial Justice Project, we are looking at how can we really assess and reform these fines, fees, tickets, and financial penalties that are growing at a time when people can least afford them. And, um, you know, really relieve the kind of inequitable burden um, of these fines and fees in ways that work better both for government and for people. Um, you know, I sit also um, in a treasurer's office, and we've learned a lot from um, what Chishara is doing in St. Louis. And I think when, you know, we saw the Ferguson report and the type of cash register justice um, that was, was happening there, um, you know, we also have an Office of Financial Empowerment that aims to build up the economic reserves of people who are really at the kind of hard, hardest edge, is, I'd say, kind of of our community. And these, you know, fines, fees, financial penalties were really decimating and depleting people's financial reserves. And, you know, we quickly learned in um, California that, you know, this is, is not just a Ferguson problem. Um, uh, in California, uh, about 17% of adults in our state, 4 million people, have had their driver's license suspended because they can't pay um, traffic court fines and fees. Uh, you know, we often see that when these um, tickets, et cetera, exceed people's ability to pay them, this kind of spiral of despair uh, can set in motion. The ticket can grow through late fees. Your credit can be impacted. Um, uh, you can lose your driver's license, which, you know, frequently causes you to lose your job. You can even be jailed for non-payment. So in about, you know, 48 states, uh, uh, criminal and court fees are, are increasing. And in 80% of states, you know, you now need to, um, defendants need to pay for uh, things that were once free and are often constitutionally required. So in four-fifths of our state, if you want a public defender, um, you're charged a fee. You pay um, kind of room and board, a nightly fee, if you go to jail or prison. Um, if your child is locked up in juvenile hall, you get a bill for every night that they're there. You're charged to rent their ankle monitor. You're charged for their uh, alcohol and drug tests. Um, money bail, stripping um, uh, uh, resources from people in non-refundable fees. You know, the, the list goes on. Um, and just, you know, in 30 states, if you can't pay these fees, uh, your voting rights are restricted. So, you know, what we've been doing in San Francisco and California is realizing that this is a lose-lose. Uh, this doesn't work for government, and it, it certainly doesn't work for people. So we've been you know, able to enact um, a number of reforms that I'm you know, happy to, to talk more about. Um, but you know, just to name a few, I'm really proud that uh, the San Francisco Superior Court was the first um, court in uh, California to stop suspending people's driver's licenses if they couldn't afford to pay traffic tickets. Uh, several other courts followed suit, and our governor, Jerry Brown, just eliminated this practice statewide. So we believe we're the first state um, in the country to do that. There is also a bill right now sitting on Governor Brown's desk to eliminate uh, fees in the juvenile justice system so that parents will not be charged um, these fees if they're locked up. If the governor signs that, we will also be the first and hopefully not the last um, state to eliminate these fees. And you know, just one last thing I, I want to mention is that we've been on such a learning curve um, about these. And one thing that we're really seeing is that often these um, fines and fees are what we're seeing is they're kind of high pain and low gain. Uh, they can really hurt families, um, but they actually bring in very little revenue because we know people just don't have the money um, to pay these things. So I um, had written an article about a young man in Sacramento named Michael Rizzo who, when he got out of juvenile hall, 
uh, his grandmother, who was his guardian, got a bill for $25,000. Uh, so she had to, um, he said, declare bankruptcy. And you know, um, the purpose of Juvenile Hall is um, rehabilitative, and this um, you know, excessive fine and fees you know, really drove a wedge into the most important relationship in his life. Well, the good news is that a few weeks later, the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors voted to get rid of these um, juvenile fees and write off $23 million in debt that was just um, hanging over these families. And at the Board of Supervisors meeting, uh, someone on the Board of Supervisors asked the juvenile justice chief, like, gosh, aren't you, how are you going to fill that revenue gap? Like, aren't you worried? Where are you going to find that $23 million? And he said, oh, no, we only project that we're going to collect $385,000 of that $23 million. So that's, you know, less than 1%. Um, so again, um, I think a lot of these things are high pain, low gain, and are just really crying out for reform. So to that end, we recently uh, saw a story about how bankruptcy hits black families and white families differently. Black families, particularly in the South, more often file for a type of bankruptcy that in theory would allow them to catch up on their debts over time, but then when they don't, I mean, it's similar to payday loans, then when they don't, they are back in trouble with their debtors and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, and we see that a lot less when it comes to um, white families who file for bankruptcy. So I kind of want to take this conversation back and talk about, so a lot of the things we just brought up a lot of people could say, well, that's a problem if you're poor, period. That has nothing to do with race. And I think this is something that we hear a lot, whether or not the conversation about poverty should be separated from that about racial inequality. So I want to talk a little bit about why some of these issues affect black Americans so much more harshly. Misha, you're nodding your head. <laughs> I want you to jump in there. I'm just sort of like, where do we go from here? Um, just really looking at the outcome, so oftentimes people say, well, all you have to do is get a job, right? And so it's sort of like when you look at the disparities along income and you talk about low-wage jobs and racialized jobs on top of that, then that creates a vast inequity within opportunity structures. And so one of the things that we've been really looking at is to the points that have been made is really looking at the HUD self-sufficiency matrix. So there are like 15 indicators along that matrix that deal with housing and um, employment and income and really beginning to have a conversation, a courageous conversation about what opportunity looks like within our city. And beginning to rank those um, interventions from one, those that are in crisis, to thriving. And so each service provider would come to network meetings where we begin to organize providers comprehensively to say, here's where you go if you find yourself in crisis and need to pay a fine. And so really be beginning to organize the community in a systematic way so that we can begin to have these courageous conversations. And another um, idea that we've been working on is to have these database discussions around meritocracy and what does that mean you know sometimes we always hear you know all you have to do is pull yourself up by your bootstraps but you know someone in our community talked about how just by virtue of having a pair of boots with straps costs more than boots without straps and so kind of really wrestling with all of these things that we constantly hear that is the common chatter, but really looking at the disparities along a racial lens. And so just starting to have those courageous conversations. Yeah, Martin Luther King once said that we have socialism for the rich and rugged individualism for the poor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the, the kind of environment that we live in. You know, we, uh, black people started off, you know, if this is a race, and you're, you're talking about a 100-yard dash, by the time the, the, the gun goes off, the white person's already at the 50-yard line, and we're still at one. So, you know, what do we need to do to, you know, what, what things need to be filled in in order for us to at least get to 50 and, and, and get up to the, to the point where we can at least have a, a fair race? 
Um, and a lot of things are being tossed out nowadays, like you know, CSAs and reparations and universal basic income um, as a way to sort of even the playing field. Um, and we talked about earlier how our communities are redlined um, and, our, and our homes aren't worth uh, as much as, as, uh, as our white counterparts. Case in point, in my neighborhood, I live across the street from my father, and he, years ago he built a great home. It's uh, uh, con in, uh, insulated concrete foam and solar panels, and you know he's real futuristic. And, um, but his home, because of where it sits in St. Louis, because it is north of Del Mar, and, and you've seen the do documentary on St. Louis called The Del Mar Divide, we are three blocks north of Del Mar. And, and you move his home four blocks to the south, and it's instantly worth a million dollars. But because it's north of Del Mar, it's only worth you know, $300,000. So those are the kind of stark disparities that exist that don't allow us to catch up on, on wealth building um, in our own cities and in our own neighborhoods. There are neighborhoods in, in, in North St. Louis that haven't been invested in in decades. And because there's no investment there, uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's no investment there, therefore the housing uh, market and the housing values aren't going to increase. So something has to be done to even the playing field. And, and you know, I think another Martin Luther King quote, he says when um, there is a you know, depression in the white community, when there's mass unemployment, we call it a, a depression, right? An economic problem. But when there's mass unemployment and poverty in the black community, we call it like a social issue. And you know, it, it, it's a different conversation we have. And these fines on the criminality, I think we have this conversation about black poverty and it's, it's a blaming conversation. Well, what, you know, we blame the criminals for their plight, right? We throw these fines at them because there's this moral judgment about criminality, and especially black cr criminality and black poverty. So the way we talk about black poverty is very different than the way we talk about white poverty. And this is, you know, post New Deal, post Great Depression, we have poverty and FDR says, this is a major issue. We need to fix poverty because, you know, it's not, we don't say, well, you know, the Dust Bowl, like, they should have not planted there. And, you know, it was their fault that, you know, and, and it turns out it was, right? Like, they should not have planted in the, <laughs> right? But we say this is a structural issue, and so we need to have a structural general reform, but when there's black poverty, and by the way, black poverty is the only kind of structural poverty that the federal government created, right? So, yes, there is white poverty, but, and, and some of that also has structural causes, but we have systematically segregated black communities and systematically excluded them from all these avenues of wealth. Um, and so it's got to be a different conversation because it has a different root causes. Yeah, and I mean, I would just say that, you know, as we've been, and again, we've been on such a learning curve about this, but whenever we look at these financial penalties and the impacts, we always see that they hit the African American community so much harder. When we looked at license suspensions, there were some neighborhoods in San Francisco where um, African American residents were like five times more likely to have their driver's license suspended for inability to pay. We did an analysis of who's paying bail um, in San Francisco and who's posting you know, these, these non-refundable fees. And you know, although African Americans are, I think, 6% of the population in San Francisco, they make up about half of people in the jail, and it is most often a African American, you know, woman of color who is bailing someone out. Bail in California averages fifty thousand um, dollars. So we did an analysis that showed that this strips fifteen million dollars a year, um, largely from African American women, um, in our city. Uh, so, you know, one of the solutions that, that we've been looking at and our, our courts are starting to take some steps on and we're having, you know, some, making some headway with folks in San Francisco and in California is the idea of basing these fines and fees on people's ability to pay. Um, you know, like as a treasurer, and Treasurer Cisneros, who I work with, is always, you know, he's the tax guy. So he's always saying, like, taxes are apportioned to people's incomes and these flat rate fines and fees hit people so, so differently. Um, you know, and what, what's interesting is, you know, you think about there's a, a stop sign in my neighborhood where um, a lot of people get tickets. Um, you know, say uh, a tech executive doesn't come to a complete stop at that stop sign. 
Um, there's a few tech executives in San Francisco. Uh, you know, if, if he gets a ticket, it's kind of an annoyance. Um, if a woman who works at the daycare center in my neighborhood gets that ticket, you know, it can be half of her take home pay. Do we really want to be meeting out consequences that hit people that differently? There have been some court experiments and pilot programs in our country where if you made fine, where they made fines and fees bearable and apportioned them to people's income, people were more likely to pay. And actually, the overall it, uh, revenue that came in went up, and the disproportionate impact went down. So those are some of the types of reforms that, that we're hoping to advance and are advancing in San Francisco and California. So every time I talk to people about this, there seem to be two fronts on which people are trying to make progress. And sometimes it seems like there's too heavy a reliance on one or the other. So one is a look at educating, educating consumers, educating people in the community. You mentioned payday loans. You know, As people go in to get a payday loan, handing them something that tells them what their other options are or that tells them kind of what the potential dangers are. And then there's the structural issue, which you guys have also addressed, which is that, OK, if I'm not going to take out a payday loan, what really are my other options? Are there other options in this community? So I'm wondering what you guys think the balance is in general and both in the communities that you work with between trying to educate people so that they can be proactive when it comes to their own behavior and their own decisions and the point at which it's not about their education, it's not about their behavior, they just don't have any good decisions to choose from and trying to kind of change that structurally. Talks about the absence of banks in, in low-income and black communities. Um, there, we don't have any black banks in St. Louis. Uh, we had one that closed several years ago, Gateway, uh, and actually the founder's daughter now works in my office. Um, but uh, and, and that, but there are payday lenders everywhere. So uh, and, and we found and studies have shown that people will trust that person in the payday loan shop because they know their family. They are very familiar with them. They you know, they know what their situation is. And if you change that, that, that brick and mortar place with, with you know, actual banks, which of course, African Americans, we don't trust banks to begin with, um, but you have, to, you have to change the environment. And if you want to change the behavior, you change the environment. So you know, it's fascinating. We have a citizens advisory board where a good majority of the members are from high poverty communities. And that has really informed our strategy uh, one of the things that we found was that with every rise in income, there's a subsidy that is lost. And that's called the cliff effect. And we've heard of that. And so it's, it's challenging when you live in a community that is subsidized and your income continues to grow up, your subsidies get cut. And so that could be a way that we were talking about not having your funds within banks that could immediately be flagged or you know, identified because that could have a disparate impact on families. And so what we've been doing is having a conversation around a ladder and really beginning to look at what does my income, if I'm at a low wage or at poverty wage, what is out there for me? What's accessible for me? And then as I move up the ladder, what does that next wrong tell me about what the opportunities are, but then also preparing me for some adverse effects. So if your income increases, then you might lose a subsidy. And then how do you account for that? So what we've been finding is that people sort of don't have that buffer or don't have that savings. So you go into uh, you know, a high interest um, loan or you know, those types of things. And so really beginning to wrestle with this with the community, because we have a certain perspective given our proximity to the issue, but going into the community, they can begin to highlight that and help us develop strategies that are the most specific to mitigate their needs. Although on, on the subsidy aspect, I would say the higher your income rises, uh, up to a certain extent, you get way more subsidies at the top uh, you know, because your mortgage interest credit, you know, we, the, the, the rich actually get way more subsidies than the poor. And so I think that that's a conversation. I have the luxury of looking at everything structurally because I don't have to deal in the community. I can just write about it. Um, but I think 
uh, for a lot of these things, it is. It's you know we keep telling people to save your money, and I've you know heard um, people say you know just skip the latte and don't have the avocado toast, and but but that <laughs> fine, yes, you can do that and still not um, have wealth. You know, it, wealth isn't created through savings. Every wealthy person knows that it's created through leverage, um, credit, through land, through property. Um, yes, I mean, once you have a lot of savings, and then we could talk about investments, like stock market or property, but on the lower end, you can't build wealth by squirreling away and not eating lattes. You should definitely still do that. And by the way, blacks save more than whites, generally, proportional to income. So, so yes, I think focus on individual choices, but also, and I'm curious what the payday lender alternatives are, because in my research, there aren't that many payday lending alternatives if you're low income. You, you really have one source of credit, and it's very costly. Like the, the lower income you are, the more you pay for everything, especially credit. Um, so this is an area where I think really we have to look at it structurally, because credit, um, the rest of us who are middle class um, get credit through a federally subsidized programs through our banks. And so we do get subsidized credit. The poor are the only ones left to the market right. on credit. I want to actually address that question in a second. Before that, I want to let the audience know then about two or three questions. We're going to come to you guys. So if you have questions or if you have thoughts, um, go ahead and start thinking about them. Condense them down, um, and we'll come to you in a second. So I do want to move now to talk a little bit about what some of the solutions you guys are seeing or thinking about are, both in terms of private sector and in terms of what governments need to be doing to address some of these issues. Um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, we started a children's savings initiative in St. Louis where every kindergartner, no matter um, where they come from, as long as they're in a public school, they get uh, $50 in a children's savings account in the local credit union. And then there's an incentive program attached to that um, for math savings, perfect or near perfect attendance, and parents' participation in financial education initiatives, either in person, online, or via a phone app, so trying to meet parents where they are. Um, so far, we um, are about to enroll our 10,000th kid, hopefully this year, and um, we've seen that families have saved about $20,000 of their own money in two years. Um, we've also ha we also have 16 families that have saved more than $500 in the, in the program. And then also, we've seen that families are starting to change their, you know, change their habits and change their lifestyles by accessing services through the Office of Financial Empowerment. But that's just the start. You know, there, there are things that we do you know, all along a child's life cycle and all along a family's life cycle that just, you know, so we do children's savings. We may do early scholarship to middle school to, to give kids a bump, to let them know that there's a future ahead. We may do last dollar scholarships as they get to junior or senior year. Um, and then also there's this crazy idea out there circling around called universal basic income. Uh, that says that you can get, you know, 500 to, you know, $2,000 per month with no strings attached. Um, and, and it's up to you to either squander it all or you can still work or you can, you know, save it, do whatever you want to. But um, knowing that there's still a gap that needs to be, uh, in my opinion, filled in order for people to have some sort of economic mobility in order to thrive. So I think that if, you know, if I had to wave a magic wand, we'd be doing all of those things all along the life cycle of people from, from birth all the way to, you know, to their, when they're in their careers. So our, our new mayor, Mayor uh, LaVar Stoney, and our new director, Reginald Gordon, was really focused on this idea of innovation and really beginning to think outside of the box. One of the things that we're looking at are equality indicators. SUNY has done a tremendous job at like really looking at inequities within um, society. And so if we can begin to look at that in a systematic way, citywide, then we, we can begin to move the needle. Because all of these parts and pieces sort of overlap. And if we don't really um, do this in a systematic way, we're, we're coming up with solutions that are organic and coming from the community to help inform policy, then we're going to keep hitting and missing. So I think the beauty of um, our office is really beginning to galvanize and be become a hub and catalyst for change. So beginning to look at the child savings accounts and how does that impact people that are in poverty 
incubating like micro enterprises and social enterprises and really um, having listening sessions where where individuals from the community can come in every Friday into an, an into our office to begin to think about the strategies that they have to solve their own problems and what we're finding is that it just might need a little bit more baking mm -hmm. and that's all that happens and you add the capital to that and then that can continue to grow but really um, lowering those um, you know dismantling the silos that we have within our community so that it does become a reflexive conversation and not just sort of navel gazing in a sense yeah I mean it's interesting talking about payday lending and uh, I think there's been a lot is, you know written about you know how about predatory lending and how lenders can be predatory I think one of the um, things that has been surprising to me and us as we've been entering into this work is that you know the realization that government can can also be predatory right this looks sometimes like payday lending like um, you know again fines and fees that exceed people's ability to pay them and then uh, you know again this kind of spiral of, of despair is set in motion so you know we've really been thinking a lot about you know, we are not advocating to um, get rid of consequences, but we just want to make sure that the consequence fits the offense and doesn't hit people with low incomes, people of color, um, harder than it hits other folks. So, you know, I mentioned some of um, the solutions that are, are advancing, facing these, you know, fines and fees, tickets on people's ability to pay. You know, sometimes thinking about can we give people options besides, um, you know, uh, paying money to resolve some of these things. So looking a lot at, you know, community service. Um, can people perform community service to uh, pay some of these things off? Looking at the payment plan um, structure. How can we make those more accessible? And, you know, again, if there are penalties that, uh, you know, again, just dig people into holes like driver's license suspensions, holding people's car registrations. Um, you know, can we, um, you know, really just just stop doing that? Uh, I do want to give a shout out. I just saw somebody from um, City Community Development uh, in the back, and I just want to thank them. They have been supporting this work and these types of reforms around the country. A huge undercurrent of the book was that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to bridge this wealth gap without massive political will, empowerment, and government changes and support. In 2017, one, do you think that's feasible? Two, what would it look like to get on track when it comes to the political will and the government changes that it would take to build and bridge the gap? Yeah, so I want to be positive here. Um, so, uh, <laughs> look, I mean, I think the racial um, myth of the post-civil rights era fell apart with this election. I think we thought that we had one story, and now we realize that that's, that's over. And so I think we, we really need to um, come up with another uh, uh, view of, of what, what happened. Um, and, and, and that's why I think, you know, I think we, we're still kind of in the in the throes of, of what is going on, but I think we have to, to really understand that we have a racial divide, and um, a lot of that is rooted in history, a history that we have yet to confront. Um, we need to confront that history, and, and on the policy aspect, the way to close the wealth gap, we know how to do it because we've done it for white Americans. We did it after the Great Depression. We know how to do it. The mixed economy, banks, government, you, you know, secure mortgages, you make them risk-free. We did it. It didn't cost very much money. It actually increased money, right? We just have refused to do it for black communities. And so if we're going to talk about it, we've got to talk about it in a way that is um, federal, large, and that targets the problem, which is segregation, concentrated poverty, all of that stuff. And, and it, but it takes looking at the history in an honest way instead of saying, oh, well, Martin Luther King gave the speech, and now we aren't going to judge people by the color of their skin. And so, good, we're over. And, you know, it's like the John Roberts rewriting. He says the way to stop racial discrimination is to stop discriminating based on race. And what he meant was we are now colorblind. 
And what we realized is we're actually not colorblind. We've never been colorblind. So we have to see color again and look at it in a way that is recognizes the history of color. All right, I'm going to take some audience questions. I see one, two, three. I hear a lot of negative, it's hurting, forcing people out. But then Ms. Jones mentioned the house your grandfather or your My father, dad. your dad has. If he could just, if, if gentrification moved three blocks up, he would triple the value of his home. So do you write about that and what do you think? Louis is a really good example of gentrification in one way. A lot of these communities get resegregated. So it's not as that, so once the white people move into one community, the black people go to another place, but it still remains segregated. So Ferguson is one of the phenomenons of resegregation. You know, there was all these urban renewal programs in a lot of these cities that, you know, James Walden called Negro removal, right? So you, 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 you know, one neighborhood blossoms, but they still get pushed to another. It hasn't so far. Yeah, it hasn't so far because the people don't own the property. If the blacks own the property in Harlem, once the whites came, then they could get the, the, the windfall. But it hasn't been the case. There isn't property ownership. There's rentals. And so they just move to somewhere else to rent. And also, they get squeezed out. Is, mm -hmm. This is something I look at data on a lot. They rent as uh, white homeowners come in and kind of purchase up land and renovate things. What was for years a $800 rental is now all of a sudden a $1,600 rental, is a $2,000 rental. So people just get slowly, slowly eked out. Also, when we look at the subprime mortgage crisis, the people who bore the brunt of those bad loans and who got kicked out of their homes and who had homes that were underwater were black Americans. So then, even when you look at places that are perhaps doing well now, Black Americans who owned those homes more likely had bad mortgages, more likely got kicked out, or more likely, even if they get the money, cannot really reap the true benefits. So if they're getting $800,000 for a home they bought for much less, you know, they're still not reaping that full, mm -hmm. uh, the full equity. Or even if we own the homes at the time that gentrification happened, uh, you know, somebody, we, we don't take care of those end of life decisions where somebody died and then it gets caught up in probate and then somebody else buys a house for taxes and then the family loses that house to help them. So a whole host of things also have, also are happening there. Yeah, just to add to yeah. that, just really quickly, um, one of the tools that we're using is a market value analysis to begin to identify nodes of strength within communities so that you can sort of, you know, have a proactive approach to gentrification and how do we sort of use our affordable housing trust fund and other mechanisms to hold on to the land so that everyone has a fair share. Right over there. Hello. Oh, hello. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Sheena Foster, and I'm with NCRC, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, here in the same building. Um, pardon me? Oh, yeah, we're the landlord. <laughs> I'm not, but my, my, my uh, organization is. So um, I haven't gotten an opportunity to read your book, but one of the things that I was a little distressed about is that you never mentioned the Community Reinvestment Act, also known as CRA, which is one of those tools that um, could be used to um, drive capital and credit to low and moderate income communities. Uh, shameless plug, NCRC like, negotiated over $62 billion um, to help low and moderate income communities gain access to capital and credit. And when you mentioned that like, de deposits were liabilities um, and that there was no structure or, or tool in place, that's, CRA is, is, is kind of like the tool. And so you mentioned how we need to get like, the federal government on board and there's all these subsidies available. But what about private capital and what about organizing to hold banks accountable? I do talk about the CRA. That's chapter seven of the book. Um, and you know, I think um, I'm a fan of the CRA. It's by my favorite senator, William Proxmire, who if you don't know William Pro he's like one of my favorite reformers ever. Um, I, I think the CRA um, was um, well-intentioned. I, I think it hasn't had the benefits that it was meant to have. Um, and, and I, um, you know, it's a larger conversation, I think, uh, than, than this panel is. And I think, yes, that definitely need to have capital from mainstream banks. The CRA is, you know, requires banks to lend into these communities. And I think it's, it's a good reverse redlining effect. But um, 
I, I'm, I'm, I am less, I'm, I'm a little bit less optimistic about the CRA being the sort of, you know, um, silver bullet here. All right, look at the uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri.gov website and look up our annual uh, HMDA report where we overlap like 10 banks that we do business with and you'll see um, where they lend and all of it, most of it, 90% of it is south of Del Mar. So there's a stark disparity there even with CRA. And we try to hold banks accountable for CRA, but you know they're still not lending in, no, in low-income neighborhoods. And that's why the, the operatives were reported at. Yeah. Okay. So let's go right back here and then around. Hi, my name's Stephanie. And I was just curious, um, Marissa, you talk about a lot of things that the government is doing um, that has hurt vulnerable communities as well as things that they can do to help. And so like, if we think of a, um, a spectrum, like some of the programs that were being talked about uh, as far as the banking ideas for students, I think are really an example of government doing more helpful programs. But if you were going to think of on the spectrum things that government is still doing that is harmful, like you talk about redlining, and I admit I don't know a ton about what exactly that means, and maybe some of the other things where government is affirmatively hurting these vulnerable groups, what would you say are some of the high, highest priority things the government should just stop doing. Like we don't have to even start spending more money on this program. They just need to stop doing this really bad thing. And I admit I haven't read your book yet, so I'm interested in your thoughts about that. Before before I answer, uh, this is Stephanie Barclay, one of my former students who blew my curve in administrative law. She's one of the smartest students I've had. Um, so thank you for your question. I think these. I mean, I think that what they've said about the fines and fees is a big example that um, the, the way our tax code is structured, I think, is incredibly harmful to um, poor communities. It's regressive. This, it's regressive, yes. So we think that we have this progressive tax system, but really, you know, I get this you know, boost because I have a mortgage, right? Um, I get tax credits for it, and that benefits the middle class or the upper middle class. These 501c3s where we put away money for our children's college, you know, there are all of these ways that the government, you know, gives the middle class these benefits that don't go to the poor. So I think one of those things, just stop doing that, right? Um, these fees, um, fines, bail, all of that stuff, providing you know, public defendants, all of that stuff, I think, would be um, ways to just stop fining. And, and you probably have better answers to that than I do. Yeah. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go right here. I mean, thank you for the conversation. I'm just wondering, it appears that inherent in all of these discussions is the whole um, difficult discussion around race. Um, and how do we move the needle? Because it appears in order to be able to get a bold kind of action around government action to make this thing, to move the needle in this direction, there has to be some discussion around race and the impact of race in terms of policy decisions. So it, it almost appears as we need those who are in charge of policy decisions, our leaders, to almost go through all an experiential learning in terms of to be able to empathize. Because I think part of the challenge is, unfortunately, it's just that there's inherent racism, but part of it also is just not facing the reality of what a poor person, the, 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 the day, a day in the life of a poor person, what does it look like? I, I, I think most people are just completely divorced from that reality that conceptually they're not even able to comprehend it. So how do we move that discussion to be able to get our leaders to say, okay, now we talk about education, we talk about the structural changes, now you as an individual you need to go through some experiential learning so you actually empathize or you have the capacity to empathize. So I don't know what, what your thoughts on that. Well, I always say, you know, we as politicians always tell people, well, you all need to have that uncomfortable conversation about race, but we're not willing to have it with each other. So there are about maybe 35 or so different uh, elected officials uh, citywide, meaning, you know, aldermen citywide and so forth and so on. And we haven't had that dis discussion with each other about race and, and also what it's like to be poor and, and maybe do a poverty simulation, for example. 
you know, I've been poor, so I know, you know, what it's like and what it's like not to have certain things and not being able to afford things and, and to, you know, try to make it to the end of the month. Uh, so therefore, I have that experiential knowledge and how to deal with uh, the people that I'm serving, but not everybody does and not everybody wants to learn. So, you know, and, 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 t and until we, you know, have those hard conversations and tell people, you know what, it's expensive to be poor. And, and these are the ways that our decisions and our policy making is hurting the, the, the least among us, which we're supposed to be serving, we'll still have these, you know, we'll, we'll still be running like a hamster on, it, on, on a wheel, just, you know, still having these conversations years and years in, in, in the future. Yeah, and I wish I had an answer to your, a, be, a better answer to your question. I mean, the only way that we knew how to start, because when we started this about a year ago, it was like, God, how do we start? <laughs> Um, and there was this coalition um, of individuals and community groups called Debt Free SF, made up of um, groups that were made up of people who were entering their community kind of after um, being in jail or prison, um, groups and, uh, that work with people who are struggling with homelessness and getting a lot of these citations or people and people who are homeless themselves legal service providers who kind of see this, this problem day to day. And, uh, you know, we started a task force, um, a good old task force. Uh, but we had um, people around the table from these groups. And this is where I sometimes think um, it can be easier to have these conversations at the, at the local level, as hard as they are. And then we had the heads of all these um, departments in the courts and we tried to start with like, what are the biggest pain points um, in the community? And where are these fines and fees and a lot of the associated penalties like just causing the most harm? And to hear people who are struggling with homelessness um, talk about that, people who are re-entering the community or organizations and social workers who are really on the front lines and then to have all the department folks and the courts um, that, that changed things, I feel like. And we were able to think about, like, okay, what's, what's workable? We're, we, we, we can't do everything, and there's this tension between revenue and equity, but what, what can we do? Because surely we can do better than this, than what's happening right now. And I think we need to have the courageous conversations. One of the unique features in our office is really looking at a lot of times we're asked to make the economic case for poverty reduction. And one of the brilliant things that we really have been, has been resonating is the tie between the city's bond rating, poverty, and regional transportation. Mm -hmm. So then that's how we set the table to have the conversation and to really talk about how it affects people across all spectrums. And this is what it looks like. Now, we use our universities as well. So right now, we're doing a study with our MPA students at Virginia Commonwealth University, really looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics does sort of an analysis of what jobs look like across race. And we're going to do that for Richmond, mm -hmm. to have that conversation, to begin to set the table to look at what equity and opportunity looks like. One of the brilliant um, things that I've heard recently was about do not focus on um, outcome, focus on, do not focus on opportunity, but focus on outcomes. Outcomes is that more tangible component that sometimes we miss. And I think that that's so critical in, in starting to set the table to have that conversation. We have a few more, one seated and then back there. I, I was not one of Marissa's um, best students, so I just would actually, <laughs> with due respect, have a question for the um, community members. Short of getting um, tickets in St. Louis, which I actually have done as a St. Louisan, I'm wondering sort of what, what is it, you know, we're all members of community here, so what is it that you wish you had from the community members? What support do you need from just regular citizens? Uh, personally, I need citizens to vote. Uh, our last election, there were 20, we had 28% turnout. So that means 72% of people decided to stay home. And then, you know, we still see those same policies uh, inter 
that are, that are there that hurt people, but you have to change the people in those offices in order to see any change that's going to come all the way down to the local level. So that's what I wish people would do. Vote more every, every time, even for dog catcher, just vote. Thank you for your, for your presentation today. Um, with respect to structural solutions, there are a host of uh, economists who have identified the systemic mechanism that causes inequality and wealth concentration uh, being the way in which private banks uh, control the way in which money or credit is issued as a debt. People like Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, Joseph Huber, and many others have talked about the way to um, address many of the issues that have been raised today from a macroeconomic perspective would be for governments to reclaim the power to issue the nation's money. So that rather than having a credit system where uh, the lion's share of the medium of exchange is credit and the sort of systemic problem is What's put in circulation is the principal amount of money, but not the interest portion of money. And because of that, the society is in this sort of competitive environment of competing for insufficient economic resources um, that can only be sustained by more borrowing at some level. And so I'm wondering whether your research has focused on monetary policy solutions, monetary reform solutions that attempt to invite the government of the people to reclaim the power to issue the medium of exchange from private banks. Um, yeah, so my, my first book um, actually talks about this uh, exactly right, because it's um, banks create money. They create money because they are um, in partnership with the federal government. We don't have the gold standard, right? So money is a figment of our collective imagination. And so uh, the amount of credit circulating in the economy is a policy decision. Right? And banks are the funnelers of this um, credit to the public. And so we have to rethink this idea of um, free market capitalism, um, wh which is fine I'm, you know, in wh wh as it applies to businesses. Banks are different entities. Banks operate with the government. right? So money is a government creation. And so this is sort of a, a, a macro discussion, but absolutely, and this is, where I, this is why I focus on banks and not on businesses, because banks are... Um, essentially the invisible hand of the government in the market. And so we have to recognize that and recognize that that's how wealth is created, is through a government policy. Historically, it, it has been, as you, we go over the history, um, and we know some of the problems with that. Right now, post-recession, we're at the lowest home ownership rate we've had in 50 years, while the stock market has had its returns. Um, also, generationally, the younger families um, are forming um, later, and they're buying homes at a, at a lower rate. So that could be a challenge if you're seeing a solution around um, home ownership. And I'm excited to read the book, too. Maybe you deal with this all there. I do. I think home ownership is still the, the root for the middle class. I think the stock market is largely fueled. I mean, I think there's a lot of foam right now in the stock market, but that's a, the, the playground of the 1% to 10%. So I think for the average American, and, and the average has pulled away from the top lately, um, I think for the average American, it's still home ownership, and that has become much more difficult. It's not as easy as if you can have stock market wealth, then by all means. But not all of us can. It's, it's only available to those of us who have excess money. And I think we're going to take one more from that gentleman right there who had his hand up. Hi, my name is Robert Burns. And I just wanted to at least leave on a note of a solution, one that I believe has possibility to get to the home ownership notion, but the notion of community land trust which is a way of promoting land ownership. It certainly has roots in the civil rights movement, but also you're seeing more activity at the urban level in cities all around the country, including here in DC, New York, Houston, other areas. But my question on San Francisco as well, when I listen to what you're doing, which I think is fascinating and really truly innovative, um, have you thought about the idea of a social impact bond to promote that? Because I can see 
where some of your outcomes may come in the future. So just a curiosity. Well, I haven't yet, but maybe we will now. <laughs> <laughs> I've, often, I've often, I, I, social impact bonds is something that I've been following and, and with some of our local CDCs uh, trying to find, you know, the right project for them because, you know, you have, to, you have to have the right project in order for them to work. So we just haven't found the right project yet. Things, one of the policies, that, like a, a, a micro policy that I think would work on this community ownership is a shared equity mortgage. So this is where a municipality teams up with a borrower to, to share the equity on the mortgage. So the municipality or the nonprofit would give the down payment, the borrower would pay the mortgage, and then you'd split that equity on the point of sale. So I think that's one option that localities and nonprofits can do, which could really boost home ownership. And did we have one other question back there that I missed? Um, I had two very quick questions. One, I promise. One, um, for Representative Jones, you talked about how we all need to vote, but and especially for dog catcher, but I, I think in a lot of state and municipal elections, there are actually a lot of elections, and we don't really, I think, fully appreciate the, the kind of the, the responsibility of voting for all of citizens. So how do you think we make voting not just um, more beneficial, but more accessible? Because, you know, going from your representative to your alderman to your dog catcher, it, it becomes not just taxing, but it's also difficult for people, especially in low-income communities and communities of color. And my second quick question is, um, we talk about um, the disproportionate effects needed out um, for people of color, particularly with respect to wealth building and home ownership. How, maybe like to leave on a note of solutions, what do you think are some ways that African Americans, because we understand that black capitalism is kind of not a uh, kind of a cure-all pill, right? But we still do see a kind of a lot of innovative things happening within communities of color. So maybe highlight some kind of examples that you see and things that we might do kind of in a one-to-one -one community level basis. Thank you. So on, on the voting question, um, I have often uh, uh, asked myself that question as well. You know, what is that golden carrot that will, that will influence people to vote, vote more or that, that shows them what, what the what the benefit of voting is, because uh, telling people, you know, especially young people nowadays, that you know somebody died and marched for your for your right to vote isn't resonating with young people now. So you have to find another way in order to help them think that that it's important. Um, and 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 I don't know what that is. I, it, part of part of me thinks that part of it is. Um, more, uh, more engagement, more involvement. And we as politicians don't do a good job of that. Uh, we only come around when three months before the election and say, hey, election's coming up, well, I need you to vote. <laughs> but we need to be more visible and more, more engaged and so people know that you know, as a result of you voting, this is what happens and, and, and just educate people more. I know that people, we say that all the time, but it really works. You have to educate and you have to increase turnout in order for people to vote. Solutions, knowing that black capitalism is not a cure-all, correct? And I think you still support black banks. I mean, I think you really do. I mean, you, I'm not opposed to all of these issues. I mean, you, you do it on both sides, but you recognize that um, how the, 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 the solution is limited um, because it's not the. It's it, you know, I, I say like use a litmus test. Are we putting the the burden on closing the wealth gap on the black community, or are we all involved? And I think any solution that isn't all of us involved is a cop-out. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you to my panel. Double hand clap for Marissa.